that's joined. This is episode 18 of Detection Engineering Dispatch. My name's Jeanette. I'm joined by Tim Frazier, Omer Singer, and a really special guest that we have. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to Alex Hurtado. She's our new Senior Technical Product Marketing Manager, and she will be the new Detection Dispatch host, so you'll get super familiar with her. I'm going to give her the floor to give a quick intro so you can get to know her um, and she can tell you a little bit about the next Detection Dispatch episode. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you to our listeners that joined live and, of course, those that will catch the YouTube uh, one later. We've got a very interesting episode here for you today. I'm very much looking forward to hearing about data lakes. Uh, my name is Alex Hurtado. I just joined the Anvilogic team from a very big blue corp. <laughs> and I got to say, I am having an absolute blast uh, being a part of this fast fast paced um, in nature, this, this moving journey, week two, and it's already been insane. So really happy to be here, uh, especially with, with these two. I mean, Snowflake, Splunk, OG, greatest, greatest power duo here, uh, especially when it comes to this topic that we're going to get into um, with threat detection and response. So again, really happy to be here. Uh, it's exactly where I want to be on the forefront of detection, you know, this detection engineering realm uh, away from the traditional monolith sim. That's the world that I come from, that I used to be in. It's no longer working. And I really want to talk about that. And uh Talk about that here. So I'm excited to pick up this series, right, that you guys have, have built uh, and continue building it and fostering this community of, of detection engineers. And, and I want to do that with insightful discussions, uh, with a pipe and hot tea of topics that we all need to be talking about, right, uh, at top of mind, the hard questions, arguing about even. Uh, so stay tuned for uh, my episode next week, I'm going to be covering exactly that very pivotal topic that every DE should be tuned into, and that's going to be all about cloud security detections, right? What detection means in the cloud, the good, the bad, the ugly. And I'm going to be doing that with a very seasoned uh, expert in building and deploying cloud detections, probably third or fourth time guest on the show, Jeanette. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, very stay tuned for that so but enough about me why don't we why don't we get into it with these guys and what we're going to be talking about here i want to second that kind of um ask people to to join in it's my second detection engineering dispatch last time we got some some great conversations going so feel free to hop in uh in any case we'll be sharing some uh security data like aha moments for uh detection engineers today uh let's quickly uh quick intro on on Tim and I, if you want to click up me. So uh, I'm Omer, based in LA, and uh, at Envelogic, I bring together customers, product, marketing, um, leaning a lot on my background in the SOC. So I started as a SOC analyst myself, um, and I worked my way up in the SOC, and also uh, spent time as a security engineer um, at a large corporation building a security data lake. So um, a lot of the experience is firsthand, a lot of it is also just from working with different security teams um, as they've been making the transition, adopting a Data Lake, and we'll be sharing some of those insights with you today. And um, I write uh, on a blog called Omer on Security. So check that out, subscribe, and uh, you'll get new posts uh, weekly in the in the mail. That nice, yeah. And uh, I'm Tim Frazier. Hold on, let me let me say a little word about myself, Alex. You're just gonna try to zoom past it. You know, I don't live in L.A. like Omer, but I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, lovely town, scenic city, USA. Uh, and I didn't finish my second line of my intro there. It was supposed to say making the technical and the logic bits understandable, right? But uh, unfortunately, I didn't finish that part. Um, yes, I used to be at Splunk. I was there for three years. And then prior to that, I was a security practitioner myself. Um, I mentioned a couple of my hobbies, but you also might find me, uh, you know, as a talking head on a few YouTube videos on the Envelogic channel. So been around here for a year and a half and uh, really excited to help folks do better in detection engineering. So now you can advance the slide. Right. Great. So um, what we're bringing here are some aha moments. The idea is that data lakes are maybe the best kept secret in the SOC. And there's actually quite a bunch of security teams that are using data lakes as part of their kind of overall security operations today. Uh, but many are still not. And we thought it'd be interesting if we took some like 
light bulb moments, aha moments that we've heard from different security teams and share them with you. So you get kind of that shortcut to, hey, yeah, this could actually be relevant. This is something that, that's interesting and, and know what others are seeing. Um, I think once you get inspired like that, you can get these aha moments yourself as well and just be more successful in whatever you do in the SOC um, through that. So the, the first uh, kind of aha moment, oops, let's stay there, thanks, um, is around like, whoa, I can use that data source that was too big for the sim. And this speaks to the scale and the cost effectiveness of the data lake. Um, we see uh, very large security sources like endpoint forensic data, cloud activity logs, even a very kind of chatty type of activity, um, custom app logs, um, PowerShell, there's a lot of different kinds of event logs that are super relevant for detections, but many times it's hard to justify getting it into the same. If, if the cost to bring in a certain data source is past a certain point, you just can't really justify it. And it kind of sucks if you want to create a detection that uses the data. Um, and so when we really change the physics on where the log data is going and where you're, where you're keeping it, where you're analyzing it with a data lake, it all of a sudden opens up an opportunity to bring in data sources that were previously not available, uh, for example, to create detections on. And um, we can talk about kind of where that comes from to help to, to explain it. But uh, before I talk about kind of the, the difference in the underlying architecture that enables it, Tim, what are what are kind of sources that you've heard security teams go like, whoa, that's, that's really helping us that we can now get kind of detections using X data source? Yeah, yeah it, it definitely comes up a lot. I think, um, you know, to your point, Omer, it's almost like sometimes these things are discounted out of hand. Um, like people say, I, I've heard this so many times when I get in conversation with somebody who um, is interested to learn about what Anvil Logic does. And uh, we start talking about, hey, do, do you have all the detection sources you want going into your SIM? Usually the answer is, yeah, yeah, we get all our security data into our SIM, right? And then I say, oh, okay, uh, what about, um, you know, DNS logs? And they're like, no, we don't get that. What about e EDR telemetry? Well, no, no, we're not getting the raw data. We get the alerts. What about cloud you know, activity logs. Well, we get the CloudTrail audit logs, but what about uh, S3 access logs? You know, when somebody's accessing data from your cloud buckets. Now we, we we don't get that. Oh, okay. So so what did you mean by all security data again? Um, <laughs> so it's almost like that we've we've kind of got in this mindset to your point that if it's too expensive, if it's not realistic, then we all of a sudden now don't consider that security data anymore. I, so I, I'm a little. You know, it's one of those things that it's been around for a while, and I remember that where, you know, we'd be talking about getting new data sources, and it's like, oh, well, we can't put that in, so let's just forget about it. And you're going, but there is a lot of value there, especially the EDR telemetry, like you mentioned. That one's the number one, but it's massive, right? If you think about every process creation, every registry modification, every network connection that happens on all of your endpoints, right? How are you actually going to capture that? Well, the answer has been not in a sim. And so I think if we have this paradigm shift where now data that we thought was too big, data that we thought was inaccessible and unusable now becomes usable and accessible, that's that was an aha moment for me that that we can now make that real. So I think it comes up quite a bit and it, it takes a it takes a second for people to um, actually admit that oftentimes um, that you know, these large volume sources that previously have been considered in inadmissible to the SIM, if you will, are now admissible. Right. And and what makes that possible is, if I had to put it kind of in just a few words, it's the separation of storage and compute. And this is a concept that's been really impactful um, to data analytics in general. It's pretty new, though, in, in, in the SOC. And so when Kind of you're thinking about well what makes this a data lake and why is kind of that sim not a data lake what's the difference it really comes back to separation of storage from compute um, where especially in the cloud um, you have an opportunity to store data directly in cloud storage so in aws that would be s3 in azure that would be blob storage um, or using a service like Snowflake that kind of abstracts it, but under the hood still, log data going directly to cloud storage. And then the compute, when you want to use that data, you're only kind of using it when you need it. And it's because it's it's separate. If you're not querying the data, you're not, you don't have that compute associated with it. That separation is what brings down the cost of storing more data and and really supports that kind of, oh yeah, whoa, I can start actually bringing this thing in and start doing detections across it and, and other data sources. So that's definitely uh, been a, a light bulb moment uh, for many security teams. 
Uh, let's go to the next the next one here. And and this is another interesting one that um, pretty different in, in data lake world versus in kind of the traditional sim world. And it has to do with when does the enrichment happen? And, and we brought in here just an example of a diagram from a more of a traditional monolithic sim. I think in this case, it's an elastic search um, and, and their approach is index based. So you're indexing data as you're getting it, you're indexing it. Um, when you're about to index it, you can also enrich it. So for example, you might have some geolocation data and you're saying, okay, I'm about to index these log events, but I'm going to um, add the geolocation, the city and country for that IP address. Now, the problem is a lot of interesting enrichment is actually not available at index time. It's very dynamic. And we have things like threat intelligence, which might be coming in during dramatically after the fact, we might have different sources coming in with some different uh, delays. And so the other approach within the data lake world, uh, where it's not kind of this index based search engine, but it's the data lake approach is you're joining data at the detection time inside that query that powers the detection. You're saying I got data set A, data set B, and I'm going to join them. And it could be joining activity with um, threat intelligence or context. It could also be context around the users, the assets. Um, what do we know about that user? What do we know about the asset, right? Um, based on my CMDB, who owns that laptop, that kind of thing. Um, even previous detections, right? At a, kind of at the index time, maybe you don't know about detections associated with that kind of user, the entity, et cetera. But later on, yeah, there's new information around associated alerts. Um, and uh, Tim, what's uh, I've, a, what's your take on it? And B, have you seen that approach of kind of joining data at detection time also used to reduce false positives? Is that something that you've seen? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, this this was something that um, some platforms were were doing, right? Like uh, the platform that, that I came from or had spent some time working on, right, does some of this at different times. They give you flexibility. I think one of the big challenges there, though, is the scalability. And when you start talking about massive scale of organizations, especially when you think about um, internal enrichment, the number of hosts, the number of users, the number of email addresses, and you're trying to translate those and have that ability to, especially if you're thinking about cross domain correlation, right? So let's say I get an alert coming from an email source, but now then I want to cross-reference that with some things happening on an endpoint. Well, sometimes the login name is not the same as the email address. So how do I enrich those things to be able to cross domain correlate? Well, that's where you need that translation, right? And if you start getting over a certain number of employees, well, then that starts to really not work well when you have a, you know, basically a lookup table of too many lines. Um, so that's where this can be super valuable because, again, that scalability factor is is uh, much better on the data lake. And so you can you can do these things where, you know, up to the minute understanding of, you know, usernames, host names, uh, who was logged in at certain time, that type of thing. So it, it really is invaluable, especially when it comes to uh, multi-stage detections. And like I mentioned earlier, cross domain, as you're thinking about these things, that's the only way that they're going to make sense. And you're going to be able to line them up is if you can do this, um, you know, at scale and oftentimes after the, uh, the initial ingestion, because it's, it may not be available at that time, or, um, you know, it may have changed. So I definitely see um, a, a lot of this as, as an advantage. Um, it's something that we've helped people uh, implement as well. And, and you bring up such a great point about scalability, where I'm, I'm glad we're, we're, we're talking about that here, uh, because a lot of times there may be a certain capability where it looks like it exists, right? You, you might look at um, a more traditional SIM, you're comparing it to the data lake, and hey, I heard on the uh, detection dis engineering dispatch that, you know, there I can join it at uh, detection time. I'm looking at my SIM, it says I can do it too. So is there really a difference there? Um, I think this is where the scalability comes into play, to your point. And the more that kind of cybersecurity is going in the direction of the data lake, it, we as security practitioners need to learn about the data platforms and how to evaluate them and compare things like, okay, sure, these capabilities exist in both places, but if one is dramatically more scalable than the other, then in production, when we're talking about a bunch of data sets, 
and terabytes and terabytes of data, we're going to have join capabilities in one. In another one, we're going to have to skip the join at query time and get back to uh, the, the enrichment at, at index where we know we have way less opportunity to uh, combine meaningful data sets. Yeah, and just, just last point on this, I know we're going to get to thread intel in a bit, little teaser there, but uh, this is especially true when you're thinking about enriching with thread intel data, right? Because that is a list that um, can scale infinitely if you're trying to track IOCs, right? So being able to kind of address that and use it at some point uh, is also something that uh, scalability is key for. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and by the way, another kind of way in which joining at uh, detection time is, uh, is interesting is if you are seeing a lot of noise, and we, we talked a little bit about reducing false positives, but another option is... Um, Hey, here's a noisy alert. Asking what additional data set can we bring in so that we don't see this alert so much. Like for example, if you have an alert around, oh, somebody's making a change in my cloud environment um, and we're getting a lot of that alert and you can say, well, look, I'm only interested if it's not one of these um, cloud admins that I know we're supposed to be doing these stuff. If you're on the DevOps team, you're supposed to do this kind of thing. Otherwise, I do want to hear about it. Okay, so now you've identified an additional piece of content, another dimension, where pull that into the detection, right? Start joining with that additional data set and basically exclude those from the detection. Now you've cut down the noise in a big way. So um, this is both for better detections and to reducing false positives. And again, not data that you necessarily have uh, to add at uh, at index time. All right, what's the next uh, moment we have? Okay, this is a this is a cool one here that I've I had a just a phenomenal conversation with a, with a sock that had a suspected breach and um, they needed to tell their leadership really quickly, hey, have we been affected? Um, something about one of their vendors, we'll go into the details, but it was a stressful situation. And they came back and they were so excited because they had this data in their data lake. And what they were able to do was just like toggle up the power and they're like, yeah, it became a little bit more expensive for a few hours, but wow, the speed, we 10 x the speed at which our queries ran. So we were able to then come back to our leadership very quickly and say, okay, no, that's fine. This was a very contained incident. We were not affected. Customer data was not affected, whatever it was. Um, but, they, but that was something that they had never experienced before because we're so used to being kind of in a, a fixed um, capacity kind of mindset, which I think even the, a lot of the the cloud sims kind of brought that with them from the on-prem. They kind of lifted and shifted. So you can they, they call themselves in the cloud, but these monolithic sims, they still have a certain speed for queries. And you don't really have that toggle. And here, and this is again kind of Snowflake specific, because that's the data lake that we specialize in. Not to say this doesn't exist outside of Snowflake, but we'll focus on Snowflake as our example of a data lake. And you can see that you can be using a extra small virtual warehouse that's kind of the compute unit or if let's say now you have a situation and you need to speed up your searches click take it to a large take it to an extra large and you what you see is kind of the uh the time it takes to run that same query goes down very significantly um definitely uh a, a really exciting kind of capability yeah i think to your point omer like this one this one's so huge when uh, you know traditionally we've we've all had to size for peak demand Right. We've always had to come into a situation and say, all right, what's the the high watermark? What's the maximum that I think I'm going to use or need to use in a certain situation? Uh, and then and then build my capacity planning to account for that. Right. Well, then, you know, majority of the year you're paying for excess capacity. Right. You, you've oversized and you can't have that elasticity to to scale up and scale down quickly. Um, we used to joke about it, call it the the, the the Black Friday capacity, right? If you're thinking about retailers and think about anybody like that's the time when your website's going to get flooded and you're going to get, you know, it's going to crash. You're going to have massive volumes of data, whatever. So it's like, oh, well, we have to capacity plan for that. Um, in, in security world where you're thinking like, hey, what is our, you know, the old school sim days was EPS, right? Events per second. And, or how much ingest do I have to have? Or what sort of compute uh, do I need to plan for now? Um, you know, when we tried to go with that peak watermark, you, you are going to overpay, right? Clearly. Um, but if you don't plan for that peak capacity, then what do you do in that situation? What do you do when that headline event happens? And we need to get answers quickly, right? To determine if we are effective, to what extent, how can we respond, right? You can't get those answers, um, you know, and you don't want to be sitting there 
kicking off your query to go and to get your cup of coffee and doing the thing that, you know, the, the socks of old used to do <laughs> where it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that in uh, 30 minutes. I don't know, maybe an hour. We'll see how long that query takes, right? Like we can't be in that situation in, in the case of a headline event. So this flexibility becomes huge and it's just kind of a baseline feature of data lakes, right? I mean, this is just part of the package. And so for security, it's, uh, again, a boon when when we have those situations where we need to get answers quickly. Yeah, it, it is part of the package. This kind of speaks back to the separation of storage from compute. When you have separated that kind of cloud native storage from cloud native compute, that's the beauty of cloud native compute. There's a virtually infinite amount of compute out there. And what you can do um, as a data lake user is kind of say, okay, I want to borrow more of that compute for now because I need to get back answers quickly. Okay, now I can kind of give some of that back, still have a little bit um, very kind of elastic. And um, and I think this is also relevant to uh, kind of an, an adjacent topic. Maybe there's like another hidden aha moment in here where uh, it says, aha, this is why I'm glad I own my own data lake. Because we do hear that from security teams like, hey, can you guys just manage the data lake for me? And I always say, well, well, wait, why don't you actually consider what you would be giving up if you let your vendor manage your data lake for you? And I think without having experienced these aha moments, a lot of times the SOC is quick to, to hand over the data lake management. Uh, hey, somebody else own this. And I'll just access it through a kind of a, a soul search box. But then you don't have access to really important knobs like this. And these aren't knobs that you need to fine tune and kind of become a, a part-time DBA just to use. Like, no, these are very kind of sassified uh, infrastructure solutions. But that's a knob that I, I wouldn't want to give up if, if I'm thinking about uh, detections, um, incident response, threat hunting, and in some cases, they involve just a small amount of recent data. In some cases, they're going to involve a lot more data. I want access to that knob. And so I can say when I want more uh, compute power, turn that, take me from a, you know, a medium to, a, to an extra large and, and have it come back within kind of the SLA that I'm trying to create. So um, I think that's it's an important uh, thing to keep in mind when you're deciding between a data lake that you own or that the vendor owns on your behalf. Oh, right. This uh, this, this next aha moment, t t what's your first impression? You see this aha moment, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, this is this is the one that I struggle with the most, to be honest, right? Because uh, data science is one of those fields, having come from, you know, pure security background and network operations, it's like, okay, data science, that's where things start to get out of my realm, right? Like we have some really solid data scientists here at Anvil Logic, and every time they talk, I'm like, okay, I think I understand what you're saying, but like you, you, you're you using these words to talk about models that I don't quite get, right? Uh, so it's one of those things that I think in security, we have to demystify it. We have to do a, a good job with that and how can we get started? So this is the one that I'm like, yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm ready to learn here on this one too. <laughs> yeah, let's let's demystify a little bit and absolutely an aha moment uh, that I've heard in working with with security teams that like like most don't have a ton of background in data science, but I think do have a sense that maybe there is some potential here. Um, and and probably like many have been disillusioned with maybe UBA and stuff that was kind of maybe the industry's first attempt um, at exposing some of this, but. Um, man, so much of the data science in terms of things like identifying anomalies is very specific to the organization. So I might have a sense for, um, hey, I have this environment. And in this kind of environment, I have um, some developers, I have some support users, and they have access to different extent. Um, but I'm pretty concerned with the support user getting compromised and that then leading to a bunch of stuff um, that, that that shouldn't be happening. That's a going to be unusual, right? Whenever you start hearing words like unusual, irregular, right? That's when you start thinking about anomalies, which are not covered by um, static detections. You need a little bit of data science there. Um, and you're probably not going to get it from, from any particular vendor. So as a SOC that, that has a data lake, you do have more options around data science, a lot more flexibility there. And what's really cool is we're seeing that the data lake providers are, are packaging more and more of the building blocks of data science. So you no longer need to be a data scientist to take advantage of data science. They've kind of taken models that work uh, pretty well consistently and they let you start training them with one command and then inferring new data against that trained model again with one command. And 
maybe it's a little bit less accurate than if you were like a full-fledged data scientist and you're picking your data science um, libraries and, 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 and fine-tuning the models and stuff. But we could still get really far even without that if we have these building blocks available off the shelf, which is happening now. And so um, this is, a, 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 I think, a really exciting opportunity to start using some um, anomaly detection that is tailored to the organization in detections. Take that into account. Get some outlier detection, for example, where, hey, this is an unusual amount of file downloads for one of our support users. Or here's a person that um, is signing in from a area that nobody's ever really signed in from. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's highly unusual for that individual or for that team. Um, and I think as you want to get more fancy, you want to get into some like window analysis on streaming data, like, yeah, that stuff it, it can get very, uh, very complicated. Where I've seen aha moments there is through collaboration between the cyber and the data science team. And this is a personal kind of light bulb for me, was just being in a room and seeing the detection engineer talking to a data scientist that previously had supported finance team, the marketing team. And we got her into the room and we started whiteboarding and we started explaining what uh, command and control is and what beaconing is. And we're like, we have all this great network telemetry. We know what beaconing kind of looks like, but we can't catch it with our detections today because we're kind of writing these, these static rules. And what we'd like to figure out is how can you as a data scientist help us with that? And once she understood what, it, what we're talking about, that typically if you do have some remote access tool, it's going to phone home and it's going to do it on a pretty regular basis. So um, connecting out, looking up a domain, connecting out to a certain IP address, um, if it happens uh, for a given process, um, every hour or every three hours for 24 hours or for 48 hours, you see that kind of repeating activity that looks like beaconing. And we want to know about that because we really don't expect it to happen in our server environment. And what was cool is once, once she understood that the data scientist was able to kind of put together a model that could detect it, write a bunch of SQL that we had no idea what was even in there, but, but at least now we're speaking the same language, right? Whereas before, if we're in some monolithic sim, very proprietary uh, language, proprietary environment, the data scientists are not there, we couldn't have even started that conversation. So um, yeah, that collaboration, I think, is the, the ultimate kind of opportunity here. Right, because you're bringing together that, that cyber domain knowledge where we're saying, hey, beaconing, this type of activity, this is what we're looking for. We can describe it and how it differs from other network traffic. And then the data science team can take that and then apply the models to try to isolate it. I think another one that comes to mind is uh, fraud as a great use case, right? Um, a lot of times this is something that cyber teams are tasked with trying to discover, um, you know, and if you're trying to kind of build detections for that, that can be very hard to figure out the signature or the specific behavior or something that you want to key in on. And so oftentimes being able to look for outliers, like we talked about, which data science is great for, can be great for detecting that fraud. Um, but the challenge is, is that almost all the time, these things are not generic enough for uh, vendors in the marketplace to really build something that fits all, right? So it's becomes very organization specific. It becomes very uh, process specific. And so, you know, in-house organizations have to be able to leverage their own data and be able to apply this, this idea of data science to that uh, to extract the the relevant events. And so, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, this is where you're gonna have the knowledge for your organization and, and what fraud types of things you're looking for. Um, and that's where you can, you know, apply these things that are now much more accessible and democratized. When we get to the Q and A section at the end of this, I'm hoping somebody, at least one person from the audience here has something to, to share with us from their experience. Cause would love, love to hear more examples like that. It's definitely a super interesting topic. Um, but uh, here is our uh, fifth and last aha moment. Um, I think ties together a lot of the ones that we've talked about so far. Um, and hopefully everybody here can take this back. And if you're not doing this today, it's uh, super exciting to be able to take threat intelligence that you have now and kind of sweep it across full year of activity logs. Um, unlocks a ton of value. You, you guys, everybody on this on the, on the, listening here probably has some threat intelligence service. You're paying for it. 
you have it, but how are you using it? Are you using it reactively in the sense of the analysts can go in and after we already have an indication that something really fishy is happening, okay, well, let's learn about it. I got an alert about some system communicating out to some domain. What do I know about that domain? Which uh, cybercrime group is using it and, and is probably in my network right now? Well, compare that to using it much more proactively where you're not waiting for the alert based on a static rule or even based on behavior, but you're, you're applying the threat intelligence proactively to data that you've, uh, that you've collected and using it to, to let your SOC know, hey, something is up. And what's, what's really kind of important to, to recognize is your threat intelligence has a lag. And I put a diagram here um, that kind of reflects, for example, what happened with SolarWinds, where attacks started in March of 2020, but then threat intelligence only started coming out in December, January, and February as research was happening. Now, a lot of times threat intelligence has to do with the initial access to the environment. So if you're only looking at like the ongoing stuff with the threat intelligence that was published, probably going to miss it. And it's really important to compare the indicators that you've received, the intelligence, to the point in the timeline when the initial access probably happened. And I brought this diagram here from a great blog post by uh, the legendary Anton Chavakin. Uh, and, and he talks about kind of you're collecting logs, collecting logs, collecting logs, and some incident is happening. And it's happening while you're collecting the logs. And for now, there is no threat intelligence. So you could be comparing the threat intelligence that you do have to the logs. You're not going to get any hits in your detections. But if you fast forward a few months, weeks, months, the threat intelligence gets packaged, delivered. Now you apply it retroactively. All of a sudden you get these matches. I think very different from how many SOCs are still handling their uh, their threat intelligence. Is that is that in line with what you're seeing, Tim? Yeah. I mean, I guess my question would be, and we just have to say this explicitly again, even though we've said it a few times, why can't I just do this in my in my sim or in my search platform today? What What is it about a data lake that allows me to do this? Oh, great, great point. And, and this goes back to retention. So with the, with the data lake, um, you have less of a limitation on how much data you can bring in, a lot less of a limitation on how long you can keep it. Once you get that separation of storage from compute, storage is very cheap. We're talking around 20 bucks a terabyte. And if you're compressing data in your data lake, uh, you can see 5, 10x compression on there. So you get between five to 10 terabytes for the 20 bucks a month. Um, that's really cheap. So you can start keeping data for much longer. A lot of Sims today still only have data for 90 days. If we look at the example of the solar wind situation, um, your initial uh, access would not be in the log data. And so even if you try doing something like this in the Sim, you wouldn't get so much value from it because of the short retention that comes with not separating storage from compute. The data lake, you're able to do it. And so you do get that opportunity. Also, a lot of times we're talking about network flow data, which is so high volume. Oftentimes it's in a whole different system where um, maybe it's not hooked into a rules engine at all. So you might be writing detections that leverage threat intelligence, but they're not being applied to the network data because that's only with the NDR. And so now it's kind of uh, out of scope. I think it's also worth mentioning, not every kind of data lake situation will support this. And, and so like when we're talking about using a data lake for this, if you're just dumping raw logs in S3, you can't really go back and search it for this stuff because it, it hasn't been organized. It's not in a, in a place that is usable. And that's why we're big fans of, of using Snowflake as opposed to just S3, because then you do have it stored in a way that can be queried. Um, and also thinking about uh, schema structure, um, making sure that you've done some normalization, uh, whether when you loaded the data or at least on query time, so that when you have the threat intelligence, you can apply it to the different uh, logs. But um, yeah, definitely different from uh, trying to do this with uh, with the traditional sim. Yeah, I just had to get us say that out loud, you know. <laughs> and I think it's totally it's important because uh, you know it can seem like well, I can just go go do back testing, I can do exposure checks, I can do these things. But to your point, it's the full year that that really can be the key, and especially in large profile, uh, high profile events like the solar winds, right? When you have things that are traced back nine months or more, it's like well, most of that most of the time that data is already gone, right? How could we go investigate if we had been part of that breach during any of that time. Um, I think the, you know, the, the other interesting facet of it is goes back to the scalability, right? When you think about 
lists of IOCs and, and Intel sources, right, oftentimes they, they're large and they keep increasing as, as new things come out. And so being able to kind of hit that challenge again of how do I deal with such massive volumes of these things and how do I check all of them against my environment, right, um, it can just become uh, very challenging without the scalability that the, the data lake Oh, brings. yeah, absolutely. I've, I've heard situations where detection team was like, they had a certain number and they're like, we are limited to 5,000 IP addresses and domains. And that's what we can use in our matching. And you can look at it that way. Or if you're in a situation where you do have that uh, elasticity of compute power, you could say, well, what if you went from a medium virtual warehouse to a large? Now, maybe you can support 10,000 or 15,000, right? So um, having that elasticity um, in the data lake now, yeah, you're removing limits also on the amount of threat intelligence that you can apply to the logs. That's that's a really interesting point. Yeah, exactly. All right. I think I think that's it, right? Those are our aha moments. Okay. So if nobody's got a question, uh, but please do, I would love to see if somebody's got a question. I want to know, uh, if nothing else, what's your favorite hashtag that Alex has been putting in the chat? All right. I mean, these are these are some serious hashtags here that uh just capturing the aha moments. <laughs> In case people are multitasking, you know how that goes. That's right. Well, these are great. Hashtag separation of storage and compute. Hashtag enriching joining detection. Uh, data at detection time. Hashtag speed of searches. Hashtag data science now possible. And hashtag using threat intel IOCs across one full years. Oh, there we go. We got to vote. Speed of your searches. No question. Boom. Nice. Nice. So... Ruben, you, you voted here. Have you been in a situation where you wanted to just kind of throw more compute power, get faster searches at that kind of point in time? I definitely have, if Ruben doesn't have one that I can share. You're allowed to come off mute, Ruben, or put it in the chat. You know, it's it's acceptable. Oh, sure, Tim, I will. Why not? There you go. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Tim. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, as a, you know, SOC, uh, since my days of being a SOC analyst all the way up to now, I've been doing out of security, like... You know, speedy searches, knowing your exposure is the number one thing that people want to know, especially higher ups. They always want to say, hey, are we vulnerable to the CVE? So when you can uh, speed up that process and also have high accuracy, that's that's where the rubber hits the road for that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. I, I, uh, I think anybody that's been in that kind of uh, hot seat is going to uh, is, is going to vote for that for that hashtag. I, I've even heard of people that kind of lost their job at the SOC because it took them too long to get that kind of uh, response. I mean, the leadership has no patience, right? If they're being asked by, you know, in a B2B, you're being asked by your your top customers. Have you been affected by this thing? Are you exposed? Um, and if you take three days to get back to them, it's uh, it's not a good look. And there's a lot of kind of top down pressure in that situation. Situation. So I, I love being able to kind of have uh, an out as a, as a SOC saying, all right, look, we need to temporarily uh, quadruple our search power so that we can get back these answers quickly and uh, then we'll bring it back down. So Yeah, lack like, of that can be career limiting and it can also be in addition <laughs> to a breach, it could be a resume generating event, as we used to call it. <laughs> Nice. And Alex, you had uh, your own personal experience with that? Yeah, I kind of like Tim, you know, when thinking about how we would do this in in the traditional SIM world, a lot of the that underlying uh, kind of storage and processing technology, the way that it was available at the time, the way that it was built at the time, really was in in kind of like rows, rows and columns, right? And I, and I find that that in order for us to ask these kind of questions, it's a lot of aggregation scenarios. It's like, show me all of the times, you know, one IP is involved, et cetera. It's an aggregation scenario. And for that, the kind of traditional methods had to read the entire disk in order to you to, for you, for them to get back, you know, this question. And so I think that we're really outgrowing that with the kind of workloads that uh, we have today. And then, and then again, across a disparate nature of, of, of data sources. So definitely uh, data lakes would be a huge thing here. To alleviate mm -hmm. that. I'm excited. All right. Well, um, you want to uh, quickly plug uh, next week what uh, what the topic is going to be? I think you, you you mentioned it, but what's what's happening next week? Yeah. So next week we're going to be covering all things cloud security detection use cases on uh, deploying what is a good detection on cloud environments. Uh, we're going to be bringing on a, sp a special and very loved guest here, uh, frequent on the show or on the on the series, uh, Mont Michael Monty. So we're going to be covering you know what is a good detection, the cloud miter framework. 
uh, and for yeah, and that's going to be in two weeks from now since these sessions are by. So please stay tuned for that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Nice. Always a good time with Mike Monty. Exactly. All right. Well, you guys are uh, been great. Thanks for um, checking out our aha moments for Data Lake. Appreciate everybody joining today. And uh, feel free to reach out to us. Check the uh, check the Omaron Security blog. Check the YouTube channel. And uh, you know we we've enjoyed it. So until next Thanks time. Thanks all. Thanks for a great chat. Yeah.